Fader, så bliver det ikke at spille det sang, de Amen. We have for today the um, uh, feast of the apparition of Our Lady of Lords. Uh, of course, we know this is um, on this day, 11 February in 1858, um, Our Lady appeared to a young peasant girl in France, uh, Bernadette Subiru. Um, and so we'll, we'll hear about both uh, Bernadette and the apparitions. Um, it's in the, um, uh, she was canonized in, oh, I, don't, I can't remember what it was, um, in 19, uh, by Pius XI. And she had a feast day of 18 February, but it wasn't on the universal calendar. And then this feast got on the universal calendar. And then the Novus Ordo has her feast in April 16th. And so she doesn't have a feast day in the traditional calendar. So we're going to talk about Bernadette uh, today as well. Um, so she, let's see, she was uh, 14 years old at the time they began to happen. Um, she was, uh, this is 1858, when the, the date of the first apparition. And there were a total of 18 uh, from this day, 11 February, until 16 July. It's a feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So significant, uh, at least for us. Um, so uh, Bernadette, a uh, little peasant girl, she was, uh, her family was poor. Uh, she herself was neither, she was not, not really... Um, educated, uh, she was ignorant, and wasn't even really very pious, as she says. Uh, but she was out in the woods uh, gathering firewood on this day, and with her sister and one other friend, and she heard a sound, uh, like a wind, and she looked around, and the trees weren't moving, so she ignored it, went back to whatever she was doing. Uh, she heard it again, and she looked in the grotto at Lourdes, and then she saw that this brining, uh, bright shining light, And then a young lady, she says a small, she's a small young lady. And she didn't know, and this is from the Lord's apparitions, we should know that it was Our Lady, and, and, um, uh, but she didn't call herself that. Bernadette didn't know who she was. She would not tell her name or who she was for the majority of the apparitions. So Bernadette sees this, this young lady, and she describes her as wearing a white dress, a blue girdle, and a yellow rose on each foot. And the lady invited her to pray the rosary with her. Now, this is the first day again. And it's interesting. So it was, um, the day this occurred was Thursday, 11 February. That's, it was the same uh, sequence that we have this, this, uh, this year. So it was like this day, Thursday, that's what it was in uh, 1858. So Bernadette uh, sits down and prays the rosary with this young lady. And she herself says that she, could, she couldn't even make the sign of the cross because her hands were shaking so much at this, this vision. So she herself, Bernadette, was not going to tell anyone, but her sister had asked her what happened, what's going on. Her sister told her, and then her sister told her mother what had happened, and she wanted to know, and so Bernadette told her the whole thing, and then her mother gave them both a spanking so, and for, for making up stories, right? That's, so the life of the saints isn't easy. <clears throat> so she goes back. Uh, actually, the next Sunday, the 18th, they went back to the same place, and she had another vision. Uh, once again, it happened. Our Lady asked her to pray the rosary. She went back on the 18th. That would have been a week from today, the next Thursday. And this is the vision in which Our Lady told Bernadette uh, she asked her to come back for the next, um, every day for the next two weeks, every single day. Um, kind of surprising. <clears throat> and this is also the day that Bernadette, or that Our Lady told Bernadette she could not promise her happiness in this life, but only in the next. And so thus began that series of visions Uh, which are very remarkable for being unremarkable. Like nothing really happened in these visions. There was no like predictions of calamities for mankind. There was no um, dire warnings. There was no new revelations. Um, there was nothing spectacular. It was uh, uh, Bernadette showing up, kneeling down, praying the rosary with Our Lady for two weeks. Of course, this is causing a stir in the, um, in the local village and so on, and the embarrassment for the family as usual. <coughs> Uh, but on, let's see, what was it, the, um, on the 25th of February, so this is now, I think, um, like three weeks after the first vision, Our Lady asked Bernadette to drink and bathe from the spring, which was confusing because there was no spring. There was a river nearby, but she said drink from the spring in the grotto. And this is where Bernadette, um, <clears throat> if you've seen that, that black and white, old black and white movie, she, she gets down, she digs in the ground, this little mud puddle sh uh, shows up, and she like rubs a mud on her face and eats this little wild plant and people are laughing and ridiculing her. Um, you know, I mean, a, a, a dramatic representation, but that's essentially what had to happen is, is that Bernadette dug into the ground 
um, this little mud puddle formed. And of course, people are uh, thinking this is, she's, this is proof that she's crazy. Uh, but the next day, everybody goes again, and there's clear water flowing out of that grotto, which eventually became uh, the, the stream, and now is a famous place in Lourdes that gets five million visitors per year. And in fact, we have a fraternity apostolate there in France. Uh, the fraternity takes care of one of the chapels there. So um, a, a good thing for all those five million visitors, right? Being able to see how the Latin mass available. Um, many, many mir mir miracles. Um, <clears throat> uh, but so our, uh, Bernadette continues coming to the, um, uh, and, and she finishes out. She finishes out the, the two weeks visions and um, the lady, the beautiful lady, still hasn't told Bernadette who she is, and the visions stop. And so it's been two weeks. There's been something like uh, 14, uh, 16 visions, and, and what, like, what's the purpose of going? There's, okay, there's, there's, a, there's a stream here, but what is the point? Uh, the next apparition would come on March 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation. And this is when Our Lady answered Bernadette's request of who she was. I am the Immaculate Conception, she finally said. And uh, this was no accident, right? This is no accident. This whole um, uh, vision occurred, series of visions occurred, uh, because it was, it was um, four years after Pius IX had issued the encyclical Ineffabilis Deus, which declared the Immaculate Conception a dogma of the Church. Right? This had occurred in 1854. So uh, the idea of Our Lady being immaculately conceived had long been uh, held in the tradition of the Church, but it had not yet been formally defined. Now, the Immaculate Conception <coughs> uh, refers to Our Lady's conception in the womb of her mother Anne without original sin. Um, <coughs> and, and this is, uh, let's see, original sin, we are all contracted, as we know, we get that from Adam and Eve, they sinned against God, they stained human nature. And other saints have been cleansed from original sin in the womb, John the Baptist, uh, the um, was it uh, St. Joseph and then the prophet um, uh, Jeremiah all, all were cleansed of original sin, so they, they lived their whole lives uh, never committing actual sin. Uh, but Our Lady was preserved from it in the first place. That's what the Immaculate Conception means. So there are only two people who were ever immaculately conceived. That is Our Lady and Christ our Lord. And um, he doesn't really even count because he had no human father. He was, it was, um, um, so he didn't uh, even have, uh, uh, he shouldn't have gotten the stain. Our Lady was preserved from it. Our Lord never even needed to have it in the first place because he wasn't from uh, the issue of Adam, right, from the Holy Ghost. Uh, so um, the fact that this is uh, kind of what do you call it, this is how heaven ratifies the papacy, I guess you could say, the, in, uh, the uh, magisterium of the church. The magisterium makes a declaration and it wasn't universally received. I mean, it, it, I mean, it was for the most part among, among the bishops of the world, but there were still those holding out, well, you know, the, the, the Pope is not infallible, et cetera, et cetera, and that would come later. Um, so this is the doctrine of papal infallibility would come in 1870. Uh, so this is kind of heaven's way of saying, like, the, the Pope said something, and then boom, just a few years later, heaven ratifies it. So uh, kind of a support for that there. Uh, but the final vision of Bernadette occurred on 16 July, the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and by that time, the grotto had been barricaded by the local authorities. And Bernadette knelt outside, said um, the rosary, and afterwards remarked that um, Our Lady had never before been so beautiful. And that was the last of the visions she ever received. Nothing remarkable happened. No miracle of the sun, no noth nothing whatsoever. Uh, the miracles would come much later with uh, the healing waters of the spring. That's why five million people go there. Now, the... Um, Authorities set up very early on in the 1800s. They had a medical doctor go there and examine things, and they had a series of proofs about like what would constitute a healing miracle. And they have atheist doctors on. They, they looked. They got doctors who were not Catholic. They wanted non-believers on the medical board to examine people who went there and would be healed. And these doctors cannot explain some of these healings. Now, despite the thousands and thousands of claims, they have 70, 70 like completely inexplicable like like a. Uh, uh, cripples whose bones are like reformed kind of kind of miracles. So these, this is not like m cancer mysteriously went away, which does that sometimes anyways for people who don't even pray. Uh, this is this is like things that are, are, are uh, what do they call it, like osteo uh, uh, bone restructuring type of things. 70 of those kinds of, of, of miracles. And people want to point to, yeah, well, thousands of them were proved false. 
will prove the 70 that happened, right? That, that's what you got to worry about. If you're an atheist and one single miracle happens, you got a problem, right? So, so we've got 70 of these such things at Lourdes. Um, <clears throat> Now, and this, this is always how you look at the life of a saint, right? When you want to look at the um, authenticity of a vision, look at their lives afterwards. This is one of the reasons, I'm sorry, people, Medjugorje is not looking so good. Because uh, the people, the visionaries, they don't have good lives. They, their lives are not good. Um, but for Bernadette, she left. Uh, I think it was eight years later, 1858, uh, 1866, she joined the Sisters of Charity. Uh, in, a, in a town in, in France, I think it was more, more north, um, along with 42 other postulants. 42! And she joined with, with them, this convent. So they served the poor and the sick in hospice in that town, and she spent the rest of her life there in the infirmary as a sacristan, doing embroidery, um, and she was admired by her fellow nuns for her humility and spirit of sacrifice. And uh, one day when she was asked about the apparitions, like, you know, having been a favored soul or something, she says, the Blessed Virgin used me as a broom to remove the dust. And when the work is done, the broom is put behind the door again. That's it. Like, that, that's how the saints view themselves as they see it. Like, they see how unworthy they are and they realize, look, I'm just like everybody else, right? I mean, you, you've got your average Catholic, well, maybe not so average, but, you know, when Christ appears, um, you just say, okay, I I'm nothing. God is everything. There's a blessed virgin. Whatever you want to do is fine. Whatever you say, I'll do it. And then she leaves and you back to normal. I'm nobody special. Um, and, and really she wasn't. She was mediocre piety. But I'll tell you, in, in one way in which she was um, extraordinary was humility, right? That's what the humble person is able to do. The humble person is able to see when something extraordinary happens that they, they pretty much had nothing to do with it. Right? It was just God, God has to choose somebody, and you know, of all his options, well, where, where's the most mediocre, right? Where's the most mediocre person with the greatest humility, or at least, you know, uh, the kind of humility that won't abuse my graces? That's really all God is looking for, right? It's, it's not this incredible uh, achievement. It's more of just like a practical realization. Uh, uh, that's what humility is. Humility simply recognizes truth. So uh, uh, another time, this is a, another great um, exchange with St. Bernadette. Uh, there's a famous quote of hers from 1870. And so the Prussian armies were uh, marching towards Paris, and there was a real, a real danger that, that France would be um, overrun. And these sisters were working in, I think it was, um, may have been a field hospital, I, I'm not sure, but there was danger uh, of, from, of them from getting overrun by the army. And so a visitor asked her uh, the following questions, said to her, did you receive in the Grotto of Lourdes, or after that, any revelations related to the future and the fate of France? Did the Blessed Virgin deliver any warning for France or any threats? No. The Prussians are at our gates. Does that not cause you any fear? No. The, is there thus nothing to fear? I fear only bad Catholics. You do not fear anything else? No, nothing else. Bad Catholics is the one thing St. Bernadette feared. She'd be petrified if she were here today. Terrified. Uh, but that's it. Why? Bad Catholics. Um, because bad Catholics really, they're the ones who have the most to lose. Because we've been given the most. We've been given the, the, the sacraments, the graces of Christ, sanctifying grace, the mass, all this knowledge of the truth. What are we doing with it? And what do they say? The, 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 the corruption of the best is the worst. Uh, when, when, when a man of great virtue, uh, how could I say this, a, great, a, a man of great intelligence, a man of great ability, a man of great power, of wealth, of esteem, and reputation, what happens when that man goes bad? He brings a ton of people with him, right? Who was the first one that fits that description? Lucifer was his name and became Satan. He was the greatest of the angels and now he's the worst of the demons. So that is what happens when you have bad Catholics, is you have all these races, all these abilities, all this truth in the church, that is then squandered. That's a horrible, horrible thing when, when the, the um, uh, uh, you know, a bishop or somebody in a high position with a lot of uh, influence and a lot of uh, people look to them for the truth. We have so much truth. We have so much credibility. When that credibility is wasted on error, we're perverted, right? And, and there among the truth is mixed error and heresy. This is why, uh, what do they call it? Heterodoxy is so evil. Heresy has to be um, carefully, carefully guarded against in the church. 
The bad Catholics fear them, and, and so we should fear ourselves, right? That's again, fear ye not he who can harm the body, but he who can harm the soul. Cast the soul into hell, which is us. Fear ourselves. So St. Bernadette eventually contracted tuberculosis, and uh, she died after several years of increasing pain and illness at the age of 35. She was canonized by Pius XI on December 8th, 1933. Uh, so Bernadette, she dug the, the stream uh, that would end up healing all kinds of people, but she herself was not healed. She died of a terrible illness. Um, and that is a lesson that we are not to look for healing of the body as much as healing of the soul. And how are we to do that, right? Why is Our Lady, why is Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception, why did she cause a healing spring uh, to, to, to spring up there in France? What's the point of that? What's the connection between the Immaculate Conception and healing? Uh, because all sickness and all death comes from original sin. Death was not part of God's plan. Illness and sickness and disease and, 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 and suffering, none of this was God's plan. He wanted us all to be immaculately conceived. That was his original intention. And so it's fitting into Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception, she who was without original sin. Uh, she needed, she suffered, uh, she would have no reason to suffer sickness or death or illness or anything else. That's our lesson, is that original sin is the source of all of our problems. It is sin. It is not God. It is sin and our participation in it. Uh, and that's what the world needs. The world needs healing from the sickness of sin. Uh, the difficulty is the world doesn't want to be healed from sin. The world doesn't want to be well. The world wants to be sick. And so that is our job is to show the world, right? First, uh, physician, heal thyself, right? We need to be healed. Let's heal ourselves before we go preaching to others. And what's the best sermon is our sanctity and quality of life. Preach to others by our example, by our goodness, and that will show the world, hey, I guess you can be a saint and be happy and pleasant and fun and enjoyable at the same time. Uh, I think it was Philip... Philip Neri or uh, uh, Francis de Sales, uh, uh, a sad saint or a, a saint sad is a sad saint, right? Sanctity and, and, and sorrow and uh, they don't go together, right? There can be joy and happiness and that's our job to show that to the world. So let's ask uh, Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception, let's ask St. Bernadette Subaru for healing, primarily in soul, right? Endure our sicknesses, endure our hardships and ask God apply it, you know, heal whatever's on the inside. I'll suffer whatever on the outside, uh, just make me whole, make me clean, interiorly. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.